Future Compute. Kicking us off, I'd like to introduce Manuvir Das. Manuvir is the head of enterprise computing at NVIDIA, where he leads teams working to democratize AI by bringing full stack accelerated computing to its enterprise customers. He brings more than 25 years of experience working in tech. Prior to NVIDIA, he held senior roles at Dell and Microsoft, where he helped create the Azure Cloud Computing Platform. Manuvir, welcome to Future Compute. Please join me. <laughs> Um, so before we get really get started, I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit about generative AI because I don't know that everybody knows the role that Nvidia plays in AI and the, the ways that your hardware and technology support a lot of this this really this revolution that we've seen. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about how that happens? What Nvidia's role is in that? Yeah, you know we actually started this uh, AI journey more than a decade ago, Matt. Um, AI had been around for a long time. You know the algorithmics of AI had been well known neural networks. But there just wasn't the computing horsepower uh, that could actually run these algorithms. And NVIDIA had been working on these chips called uh, graphical processing units, or GPUs, that we used to render graphics on the screen. And uh, there were some uh, researchers who realized that that same technology that accelerates the rendering of graphics on the screen, because you have to paint a lot of pixels at the same time and you do that in parallel, they realized that that was really amazing at paralyzing the processing of neural networks. And that's why we got, you know, thousand factors speed up in running these AI algorithms. And that's what really made deep learning uh, possible for the first time. And we've been on that journey for a while. Uh, but of course, uh, the world hasn't really seen it because the uses of AI was so, sort of more hidden. For example, the video we're playing here is from Amazon where they do a great job of, uh, you know, using robots all around their facilities. And I know you have Werner here later as well. Um, and this is using, uh, you know, AI technology from NVIDIA, uh, you know, visual AI to understand what's going on in the environment and, and plan things accordingly. Um, so we've been working on AI for quite some time, but these use cases have been hidden from the average consumer. But of course, now we've had, you know, the chat GPT moment where for the first time, I think everybody, no matter who they are, uh, you know, my 13 year old daughter uses chat GPT every day. So she finally knows what I do for a living. So. <laughs> Let me let me go to something that you and I talked about uh, when we had, were having a conversation before uh, before this interview. Um, you had talked about these basically two approaches, and yeah. one is the open AI approach, which yeah. I think a lot of uh, people are now, as you said, becoming really familiar with with ChatGPT. Um, but that approach takes tens of millions of dollars, an enormous amount of computing right. power, an enormous amount of resources. It's not something that that just that a lot of anybody can do. Right? Yeah. So uh, talk to me about, the, about that approach and this other more specialized approach that you had. That you had. Yeah, you know, so uh, we hear some of these buzzwords, large language models, right, uh, for generative AI. So what I think the way to think about it is this, right, that uh, what OpenAI has done so brilliantly with GPT, and by the way, we at NVIDIA are massive fans of OpenAI, right? We work very closely with them. We've helped them uh, build their whole technology. So there's one part of things where you basically essentially are replicating the thinking of a professional human. And if you think about a professional human, there are two things you have. One is you have some general knowledge that you've acquired over time. You learn a lot of things about the world and how it works. And then the second thing is you have a set of skills. You know how to do certain things. You know how to write a poem, you know how to write a summary, an essay, that kind of thing, right? So these really large language models that we talk about that have been trained for months and years, what they're basically doing is acquiring those two things that professional humans know how to do a large body of knowledge taken from the internet and a set of skills that they're trained to mimic and copy, okay? So you've got that one thing. And what OpenAI has done is just brilliant. I'm sure you've all experienced it, right? Now that's sort of a generic human function. Uh, then if you think about in a professional world, you're a bank, you're an um, equipment company, and when you want to use this technology, of course, you want it to be specific, right? Because there's knowledge that only your company has usually proprietary knowledge. The skills that only matter to you. For example, if you're an auditing company, your employees generate certain kinds of reports, right? If you, if you fix equipment, you want to generate manuals, that kind of thing, right? So what you need alongside this sort of generic human in the large language model is you need the capability to ingest this knowledge that is specific to company. Uh, you need to be able to ingest uh, and learn the skills that are specific. 
But really, the most important thing is you need to teach this model what not to do, right? Imagine that you're using a large language model in a chat situation with the customer of your bank. Uh, you don't want the customer to be able to ask the model a question like, what was really the reason for the beginning of World War I? right, and have the model express an opinion. But of course, you know, today, if you use large language models, they will do that. They will give you that opinion, and oftentimes it will not be expressed as an opinion. It'll be expressed as sort of fact, right? One thing that humans are good at is, if you ask me a question, and I'm only 3% sure of the answer, I'll probably express it to you in a way that says, well, I'm only 3% sure of this answer. But when you talk to a large language model, typically, it'll give you the same tone of confidence in that yeah. case as it would if it knew it 100%, right? So you need a whole body of technology to help keep these, the, these models uh, working the right way. So, so you mentioned the two approaches. So just to sum it up, you know, uh, we love OpenAI. It's the sort of the, the one size fits all, if you will. You just use that thing. And then, of course, we help them. But NVIDIA in particular, we're very focused on the other approach, working with all the companies in the world to do these three things. How do you ingest the data that is specific to your company to make the model better? How do you learn the skills that are specific to your company? And then uh, what I'll talk about a little more, how do you keep the model doing what it should do and not have it do uh, what it shouldn't do? I, I got to say, though, I do look forward to being able to call my bank and have them give me my balance in the form of a sonnet or, you know, or, or some sort of other poetry. Yeah. But so when we, when we talked, I mean, the first thing that came to my mind when we, were, when we were starting to talk about this is I said, oh, well, so do you mean like uh, Bloomberg GPT, which, you know, Bloomberg has, has released uh, their, their, own, uh, their, their own large language model where they are basically looking at just financial data. And you said, no, no, even, even more specialized than this, there could be hundreds of thousands of smaller models. Can you explain uh, a little bit more about that? Like, like what, yeah. what are some of the types of... of, of so, for example, things? right, uh, consider a company like ServiceNow or Slack, or any of these uh, tools that all of us use every day, right? Uh, where uh, if I take Slack, for example, um, every company that uses Slack um, has a lot of conversation going on between their, among their employees on Slack every day. All that information is very specific to that company, right? So uh, in that context, every one of those customers of Slack or a customer of ServiceNow needs their own model because they want a model that is trained with all of the data that came from the conversations that have happened in the past at that company. And you don't want to mix the data of the two companies, right? This is not the internet where you say, I'll train one big model by taking some web pages from here and some web pages from there and use those together to learn something because that's public information. But a company like ServiceNow that deals with, for example, IT can't say, let me take all the ticket history of NVIDIA's IT and the ticket history of, say, Microsoft's IT and combine them together into one model to learn something because now you've got information that is proprietary to, do to, to different companies. So the reality is you're going to need, every company is going to need its own models and probably much more than one model. And these models have to keep evolving over time because the information in that company is constantly changing and the functions of that company are changing. So you have to learn new skills all the time. So let, let's say like just to, to, to play that out a little bit. Let's say that I'm the CTO of a, you know, maybe I'm a CTO of like a small, mid-sized company, say a, a, a you know, I, I do healthcare in rural Oregon or, or somewhere like that. Yeah. Uh, chain of chain of clinics. So uh, how, do, how do I begin thinking about developing these models? How do I begin thinking about, about doing these smaller scale AI build bots? Because we're, we're, we're so used to hearing about this bigger thing that right. I, I think that, you know, there are probably people out there wondering, like, as, as I alluded to in my introduction, like, What's my chat GPT strategy? Right. What's, my, what's my, you know, generative AI strategy? Right. And not even knowing where to begin. So, yeah, so we definitely have a particular view on that, you know, with all the work that we've done to date. Because one of the things about NVIDIA is we're a platform company. So we work with everybody who's doing generative AI, right? Because at some level, they use our technology, whether it's just the hardware or our software stack or what have you. And the general pattern that we see is there's a few companies in the world that will train very large models right, where they spend uh, $100 million, many, many months building up a massive model. Uh, but, uh, and of course, they can do that. But the general pattern will be starting with the pre-trained model. So, you know, OpenAI has pre-trained models, NVIDIA has built pre-trained models, where, as I said, you've already inculcated a general human 
capabilities, like general knowledge and skills. And then what you do is you go through a process of fine tuning, where you take that pre-trained model as a baseline, and then you train it further with the data that is specific to your company, and you teach it new skills. And at the end of that, you get this sort of modified model. Okay, so instead of spending the hundred million dollars in six months to start from the ground up, you take a pre-trained model and you spend maybe a week and a few hundred thousand dollars building up the model for you. Um, and then once you've done this fine tuning, there's a technology called prompt tuning, mm -hmm. uh, which and I, I, I would predict to you that in a few years from now, there's going to be an industry across the planet of people who are being trained to be prompt engineers, just like you have database administrators in the world today. Because the thing with prompt engineering is when you use a large language model right off the bat, uh, which is called zero shot, it does a pretty good job of understanding what you want, but not awesome. But as you converse with it, as you guide it, uh, you get a better and better answer. So there's actually a skill in how to talk to a model and guide it to get you to the right answer. And you're going to see a cottage industry of people who get that training, how to do a really good job talking to a model and directing it to get just the answer you want. So I think you're going to see that. So there's this process of prompt tuning. And then, of course, once you've got the model, these models are pretty big. And so to actually, uh, what we say, serve them, meaning ask them a question and get that answer within your application, you have to host them on some infrastructure that can be fairly, um, you know, fairly expensive. So uh, you can train a whole model, or you can take a pre-trained model, you fine-tune it with all the information of your company, then you prompt tune it, which you do every time you use it, um, and then you serve it. That's sort of the, the recipe, if you will, for using these things. Um, I, I want to get to accelerated computing in a moment, but I also want to take a moment before we do, because I, I think this springs up something that I think you announced recently on a, it's not exactly this, but, but on the guardrail yeah. that you've got. Like one of the issues with, uh, with, uh, with models like ChatGPT, as you alluded to earlier, is they can tell you something with a great degree of confidence and it might just be completely bogus, uh, or, or at least 97% yeah, right. bogus. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about, about the, the, this, this announcement that you've made uh, here. Uh, yeah, so this ago. is something we're quite, uh, we're quite proud of, Matt. We call it Guardrail. So we have a platform called Nemo, which is our software platform for generative AI. And so Guardrails is part of that. So I alluded earlier to the idea that there are certain things you don't want your model to do. Uh, one of them is, it's called hallucination. We have these very nice technical terms in the industry, you know. So hallucination, which is when the model says something that it, it really shouldn't. Um, so we've built this technology called guardrails. It's completely open. And what I mean by that is there's going to be many different vendors who have their own models, right, and their own systems. So in this field, which is evolving so quickly, I think the right thing for researchers, for vendors to do, is to build their pieces in a very open way so that people can mix and match them because this field is evolving so quickly. So we've built this guardrail technology and basically what it does is when the model has generated a response, by looking at, by using AI again to look at the question that was asked, the response that was created, rules that have been provided by the company, uh, general ideas of what, you know, uh, sense and sensibilities and using other kinds of trained models, we can actually decide whether the response from the model is appropriate to provide or not, right? Mm -hmm. So in this way, you're keeping the model on the guardrails and the user doesn't, you know, see those outputs from the model that it should. And it's sort of this plug-in, this, uh, I don't want to say model, but it's a plug-in concept, if you will, so that you can mix and match with different kinds of models and things, right? So that's guardrails. We just announced it. As I said, it's, it's adopted, uh, being adopted widely across the community, whether it's OpenAI or any of the companies you know about. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, area as we go forward, right? How to use these models in a, in a responsible way. Yeah. Um, so another thing that, that, that I think is a huge issue with AI right now is it's incredibly resource intensive. Yes. It's very energy intensive. Yes. Um, talk to me a little bit about how NVIDIA ensures that you know, your hardware, this AI hardware, can remain energy efficient environmentally yeah. friendly, giving all these increasing computational demands uh, of AI? You know, it's interesting because I think um, we all know that more and more of the world's work is being done by computing, right? On, ser in, on servers and data centers, there's an interesting statistic that if you look at the energy consumption of the world today, computing is a couple percentage points of the energy consumption of the world. But in a decade, it'll be more like 10% of the world's energy consumption, which is a massive responsibility that we all have to think about, right? And perhaps the biggest workload that we're going to see 
adding to this uh, compute consumption is AI. And in fact, generative AI, right? So um, it's all running on what we call accelerated computing. That's what NVIDIA does. There's the GPU hardware and the software, which makes things go a thousand times faster. I mean, this sounds shocking to say, but it's a true statement. Over the decades that we've worked on this, man, uh, we have achieved a million X speed up in how you run things by running them in this accelerated computing format. You know, the world has known about parallel computing for a long time, right? Many of us have done computing research. That's always been the holy grail, how to build a parallel computer that makes everything go a thousand times as fast. And the lesson was that you can't just take a generic piece of code and make it go a thousand times faster by parallelizing it. But there are certain domains where you can do that by changing the algorithmics. We did it for graphics, we've done it for AI. And so generative AI today, fortunately, is primarily built on accelerated computing. And the thing about accelerated computing is it just takes something and makes it go thousands of times faster. And that has two important effects. The first is it saves you a lot of money because the same thing that would have run for a year on hundreds of computers can run for a few days on fewer computers, which means that your cost of operation goes down dramatically. But much more importantly for the world, it means you use much less energy, mm. right? So this is the misnomer that, that we see a lot, Matt, which is um, I meet people and they say, uh, well, an accelerated computing server with your GPUs in them, right, it consumes more power than a regular computer, a regular server, and it costs more than a regular server. And these two things are absolutely true. I can sit here and tell you with a straight face, the computers that we build at NVIDIA are the most expensive computers the world has ever built, uh, okay? And they're power hungry. They consume, you know, multiple times the power a regular server would compute. But the beautiful thing about accelerated computing is if you put your workload on, on these kinds of servers, it goes a thousand times faster. And so even though it looks like one server costs more money and consumes more power, in the end, to do your workload, it actually consumes much less power. And uh, you, know, you, uh, you spend much less money. And these are two things that are really important in the world right now. So I, I, want to, I want to dig in on that. I also, before I do, uh, I want to remind uh, people that if you have questions for Money of Ear, you can ask them on the event platform. Uh, we also, I believe, have some mics where we can run uh, to folks in the audience. But so, so this energy consumption and this efficiency, this is, this is I believe, why you say that you, you want the, uh, you said you basically want the entire world to move to an accelerator. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're, we're very modest. We believe that <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. all the world's Everybody. computing should run on, on accelerated computing. But the reason is the following, right? So we've been building up these massive data centers, right? Whether it's uh, the cloud companies who have just done amazing things. I know you have uh, Vernon X and just look at what Amazon AWS has, has shown the world and, you know, and others have done the same thing. So whether it's these big public clouds or it's individual companies with their data centers, what's happened over the last couple of decades is massive amounts of compute infrastructure has been put into these buildings. And as more buildings have been built and more infrastructure has been put in, the capability and capacity has increased. Uh, however, this can't go on, okay? And there's two reasons this can't go on. It's because the buildings are primarily uh, uh, filled with traditional computing, servers built with CPUs, Okay, and for years we've written this thing called Moore's Law, right, where the cap capability of CPUs has just increased over time. Uh, and that has tapered off. That's just not happening anymore at the same rate. So the question is, the only way growth is going to happen, the only way you're going to increase how much computing the world can do, is by just creating more and more data centers with more and more equipment and more and more energy footprint. And this is just a, a losing game. However, there is another technology curve that is still very much on this growth curve. And that is accelerated computing with these different kinds of processors, right, that, that we call GPUs. And so what we believe is that what you're gonna see in these data centers going forward, uh, if you're building a data center is, start packing them with things like you see back there, which are servers with GPUs in them. Because for the same amount of space in your data center, for the same amount of power consumption in your data center, you're gonna get 10 times the output. So literally, if you take a building, so like you see there in the picture, you know, it's just a, a corridor of racks in a data center. If you take a regular data center today that is packed with CPU servers and replace it with something like that, you're just going to get tenfold output from that data center than you're getting today. And so we think this is the big challenge going forward for the industry, for the community, workload by workload, because this isn't a magic uh, formula, you can't just put these things in and every workload will go faster. We've done graphics, we've done AI, we've done data processing, 
uh, you know, it just goes on and on. And when you look at the, the innovations that we announce every year, it's just about finding new areas of workloads that you can uh, move to this kind of computing. But we really believe this is the future of computing. Yeah. Can you talk to me about what some of the key challenges NVIDIA is trying to address and scaling up to meet these to meet these increased workloads? Yeah, you know, this is complex, this is hard. It's like, uh, do you drive your Toyota every day or do you drive a Formula One race car every day, right? And and it's challenging to drive a Formula One race car and to keep it going, right? And I have a Toyota to be clear, by the way. Uh, and that's why Toyota's are brilliant, right? So what you'd like is, uh, the ideal would be if I gave you a, a car that has all the capability of a Formula One car, but the ease of use of a Toyota, wouldn't that be perfect? It'd be nice. Okay, and that's basically our mission at NVIDIA, right? That's what we're trying to do. So these complicated diagrams, that's all the secret sauce inside. But at the end of the day, we build these systems. That one, uh, that's our new DGX H100 system, which is now shipping to everybody in the world. That is a supercomputer. You know, so you used to think about all these national labs, et cetera, talking about supercomputers, and you got all this stuff going on in a building. That one box there, it's a supercomputer in a box, and you program it the same way you would program, you know, a regular computer and just hit go, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's our mission. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I want to make sure we've got some, some time for audience questions. We've got a few coming in. Uh, Bill is asking, uh, does the use of guardrails require constant retraining and updates to validate with the latest data, or is it heuristically evaluating? Do we double our costs by adopting this? Okay, so the first part is, the answer to the first question is it's both, okay? So um, partly the way the guardrails work is uh, you add new rules to it and you can keep adding more rules all the time to refine what the guardrails are doing. And partly there's AI in the guardrails themselves and that's something that we keep evolving, right? So as you release, as we release new versions of the guardrails uh, technology, the AI in it will be, will be improving. Right, so that's the first answer. Second question was about, is it gonna double the, the, the compute? Do we double our costs by adopting No, we don't, because in running the guardrail, you're not running that original model all over again. What you're doing is you're taking the output of the model, which was that first part of the computation, and then you're, you're examining it, filtering it, testing it in certain ways, right? So no, you would, that would not be the idea. See. Um, so we're, I'm getting questions here from the platform. Just a reminder, if you're in the room, you want to ask a question, just raise your hand and, and someone will bring a mic to you. But I have a question here from uh, Satish who says, do you envision a future where these models will become so good at understanding human intent that prompt engineering becomes unnecessary? You know, that is an interesting point and certainly those discussions have happened. But I think, um, you know, and your guess is as good as mine, but certainly I think there is a period of time for sure, where prompt engineering is going to be very, very important. And we've barely scratched the surface of what these models can do. So I think there's a phase ahead of us where prompt engineering is going to really be big, and then we'll go from there. I see. And uh, forgive me if I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name here, but uh, Tiagi would like to know what the time frame before GPU will lose its power and will we need a new technology for sustainability? And there are two, uh, I believe there are two audience questions as well, which we'll get to. Okay, let me take that one, yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we see a long road ahead for the innovation in GPUs because every year uh, when we produce our next generation of GPUs, we ourselves are amazed by how much further one generation goes from the next. So, so we keep working on that and we're quite confident that that curve ahead of us has a lot of runway to it. But of course, you know, we're, we're at MIT and it's uh, places like this where humans are constantly looking for, for new technologies as we should, right? So we'll see, uh, we'll sort of see what lies ahead uh, on that front. And I believe we have a question in the back of the room. Is that correct? Good morning, Michelle Bala from Advocate Health. Guardrails, I just want to talk about, would you want to talk about bias and how that's being addressed? Because that's pretty important for us in healthcare. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's one of the aspects of, of the guardrails technology. And in fact, uh, Vishal, you give me an opportunity to, to clarify. You know, I talked about building these things in an open way, right? Uh, because no one team or one company can have all the ideas, right? So our guardrails technology has two parts to it. One is we've added certain modules. We've created certain modules that deal with bias, et cetera. But the other thing is it's built as an open framework. So you can plug in additional modules that you come up with, right? Because this is gonna keep evolving and bias is different in different contexts, right? So you can't just build the one size fits all 
rules about bias, right? And so what we really envision is uh, the collaboration between, you know, let me just call them suppliers for now, whether it's research groups or vendors or the community producing these modules and users is going to be tuning the bias, uh, you know, modules and things specifically for that context, right? It has to be a collaboration. Uh, it's not so much uh, in generative AI, I think there's only going to be so many off the shelf things you can just pick up and use like Office 365 and I'll just use it. I know how PowerPoint works, right? There's going to be a lot of collaboration. Uh, and I know we're out of time, but I also know that this gentleman has been waiting to ask a question. I want to make sure we get to it before we. Hello, my name is Shriram and I'm a VC. So my, my question is along the lines of what is next? So, um, you know, again, you develop specialized hardware and you are not coming after the fact that somebody releases something. So you are working in conjunction, you know, ahead of time what is coming. So what is the next big thing after GPT that you see? Where's that crystal ball? I got to find it somewhere. <laughs> I wish I knew. Uh, I wish I knew because I'd be retired. But uh, uh, so I don't have a direct answer to your question. Okay, but if you don't mind, I'll cheat because your question prompts me to provide, uh, to make a different comment, which is, it's not just about the hardware. You know, uh, we actually, in our company, we spend 80% of our time on the software because this is a full stack computing problem. You have to design the hardware, understanding the algorithms that are going to be run on the hardware, and you got to work on the next iteration of your algorithms, understanding what the hardware can and cannot do. So what we do is we work on the two things in conjunction. It's like the engine and the transmission. You know, those things have to go together, otherwise there's no point, right? So it's a full stack problem. That's the way we approach it. And I think certainly one wave of innovations you will see over the next few years is just how that uh, interaction between the hardware and the software is just becoming more and more direct, right? So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much, Manuvir. Sure, it was I my appreciate pleasure. it. It was really great. Yeah. Can we give uh, Manuvir a hand, everybody? Thank you. Thank you.